You know. Eleven months ago on this program, President Volodymyr Zelensky told me that his goal was to remove all Russian troops from Ukraine. The interview took place during a time of triumph, just as Ukrainian soldiers seized Kharkiv back from Russian control. Today, the picture looks very different. Ukraine is evacuating civilians from Kharkiv as Russia mounts an aerial bombardment of the territory. Western officials have expressed disappointment in a much vaunted counteroffensive, which began in June. Ukraine has only taken back an estimated 100 square miles of territory since then. So why does the counteroffensive seem to be faltering? And does Ukraine have a chance of gaining more ground? Joining me now to discuss is Alina Polyakova, the president and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis. Welcome, Alina. So tell us if, if, if we are right that the counteroffensive is not going as well as people had thought, what is the central reason? Is there a central reason? You know, the expectations on the counteroffensive were, from the start, I think, unreasonably high. And there's really two main reasons for that. One, Ukraine has never had complete control over its airspace. And if you think about carrying out a land counteroffensive, which is, of course, what the Ukrainians are doing, while being bombarded from the air, constantly encountering mines, no U.S. military operation would be carried out in the same way without complete air superiority. So that's one significant challenge uh, that is really slowing down the Ukrainians. And, and the second reason I think that's equally as important is that after many uh, colossal blunders in terms of its tactics and operations, the Russians have now also adapted to uh, a long drawn out conflict and they are now in the position of defending territory, which in some ways is easier than taking back territory. And those are, I think, the two main reasons for why we are seeing the kind of on the ground dynamics that have disappointed some Western officials. So that raises this very you know, difficult question going forward, right, which is that Russians are now defending uh, and they've often dug into these positions and they've put landmines in and the Ukrainians are uh, trying to attack. And, you know, traditional NATO doctrine would say you need, what, a three to one advantage in manpower, maybe a four to one advantage to uh, to achieve any kind of victory. Is it possible for the Ukrainians to break through this Russian, these Russian, you know, they've got landmines, then they've got trenches, then they've got uh, artillery behind the trenches? Look, everything is really unknown in the fog of war, right? Uh, certainly right now, uh, it doesn't look like Ukraine is in an enviable position. They're also taking high casualties. Over the last year and a half or so, the Russian side has dug in. Uh, they have mined uh, the areas between themselves and the Ukrainian advance uh, very, very heavily. That is hurting the Ukrainians in huge ways. A lot of the weapons that the West provided earlier on in the war, tanks, for example, are being taken out by these mines at, at a higher number than I think many anticipated. And I think now is the moment to rethink our Western policy as well, because we weren't prepared for this kind of war. Uh, we were supplying Ukrainians with weapons to at least be able to defend themselves, uh, but we weren't supplying them with the kind of s weapons they need to be able to launch a proper counteroffensive, which first and foremost means uh, high long range missile capabilities so they can disrupt uh, Russia's supply lines behind the front lines. They are very limited in their ability to do that. So never say never, but I do think the outlook uh, does not look positive for Ukraine over the next three to four months. When you talk to Biden administration officials, they usually have two uh, 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 arguments as to why they haven't done more faster. Uh, one is that the Ukrainians need to be trained on this equipment. The second is that with longer range missiles, you are, there is a balance. You don't want to use missiles that attack deep into the heart of Russian territory, uh, which could uh, give the Russians the uh, provocation to feel that they were at war with NATO, to use tactical nuclear weapons, to get much more aggressive in terms of their aerial bombardment of Ukrainian cities. What do you think of those, uh, those arguments? Uh, the argument that we're going to somehow provoke Russia beyond what it's currently already done, I think this is a red herring, frankly. Uh, mainly because I don't think there's a high chance that the Russians will go 
um, towards the nuclear uh, decision. We have managed that nuclear escalatory risk very, very effectively, and the Biden administration deserves a huge amount of credit for that, certainly. And it's not in the Russian interest, because they would lose whatever uh, alliances or partnerships they still have with countries like China, with India, who do not approve of nuclear use and have made that very clear, even publicly, as well as privately to the Russians. And my second point would be in terms of reaching further into Russian territory by the Ukrainians. Well, look, this is war. Um, if you're not able to disrupt your enemy's supply lines, if you're not able uh, to hit uh, their, uh, their centers of operations, even on Ukrainian territory, the Ukrainians cannot fully reach Russia's logistics and supply lines in their own country. And I think this is where the real problem is. Ukraine will, has no interest in attacking Russia. They don't want to escalate this war. As President Zelensky said on your program, they want to take back their own territory. And currently, they don't have the reach to be able to truly, truly fight this war in the way that any Western military would have in a, in a similar environment. Alina, that is incredibly enlightening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fareed.